Um, so I have this personality conflict where I have a bit of me that's like very much an empath. Very much on. It, like an empath, you know, like. Um, you feel things very yeah, sensitively. Yeah, I feel, right? yeah, I like to, um, I guess I have a sense of compassion, but I'm confused about it, I guess, uh, and I'll try and explain. Um, like I love commiserating with people, you know, I love hearing what they're about, you know, their story and, yeah. um, but um, it's going to be hard to explain. I have that part of me and I think that, that I love that quality in me, but at the same time, um, I'm also uh, artistic, uh, which has a tendency of, you know, I like to express myself. Um, uh, I'm a musician, I'm a, a designer, an artist. Yeah. So there's a sense of like wanting to be myself, you know, and I love that part of me, but I'm also, I also have this part of me that, you know, loves to hear and uh, other people's stories and, and also feeling what they're feeling as well. Mm -hmm. So I feel like a lot of times I have this um, conflict between the two. Um, and it's very difficult because I feel like, um, and it's interesting what you were first referring to in the beginning, which was the stories we've been told about what love is and then the reality of it you know like I feel like I've been told that story in the beginning um, w with my childhood and my family and the way that they express love and you know I believe that they're very well intentioned but I've always had a rebellion um, because there was something that I think that I felt about what you're talking about somehow inherently I felt like that was the right way but I didn't know how to articulate it so I've always kind of been fighting those two um, anyway I feel like it's been damaging to me, you know, like I want to be able to express myself and I, and I feel like to a large degree I'm, I am able to express myself quite a bit, but um, so I'd like to be able to um, understand people without, without being, without losing myself, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah, can I clarify, you're really saying that you feel like when you speak to others and hear others, you you have to compromise yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and so the only reason why you would do that is for an addiction, right? Inside of yourself to be met. So there's got to be, so there's, a, there's always a reason why we do things. So there's got to be a reason. What do you get out of being empathetic? Yeah. Uh, being liked, I think. You get to be liked? Yeah. Anything else? Accepted, you know. Accepted. Um, you know, here's, here's, he's a good guy, that kind of thing. Yeah, you know. so nice approval. approval. Yeah, approval, that's yeah, it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Anything else? Um, well, there's no conflict, I think. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't have to have any fear of potential conflict. Yep. Disagreement yeah. with No disagreements. Yep. 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 So that's great. Yeah, you peaceful get to, guy. You know, yeah, you get to avoid. You everyone's get to like, oh, that guy, yeah. he's awesome to hang out right, with, right, isn't right. he? Yeah. 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 And, I, and I, you know, of course, I do believe in peace and everything, but I want to know, like, the right way to do it, you know? So. Of course, of course. So, so in this process, you're having to, you're doing all of these things. Understand that you're doing them for yourself. You're not doing that. You, you're not empathetic for the other person. <laughs> you're empathetic for yourself. You're empathetic to another person so that you can get a few things from them. Does that make sense? So there are selfish motivations for your empathy. <laughs> so you need to firstly understand that. And. Um, once you understand that, you realise that you, the only way for, to purify any form of empathy or compassion is to actually work through all of your own selfish motivations for undertaking such a course. Right? And this is what draws you away from yourself. The addictions you have towards those particular behaviours cause you to go away from yourself, and you notice that occurring. On the other hand, you also have addictions about your artistic desires and so forth. You see, the problem with, with anything that we have generally when we're in an injured state is that there are positives and negatives in any course of action. So let's look at the positives of being empathetic. It's, it's lovely to understand another person and why they do something. It's a very good thing. In fact, every celestial spirit understands every reason why you do everything. So they understand that. They don't go along with all the feelings you have about it because they don't agree with them. You know, they don't, they're not in harmony with love if they did go along with those feelings. But they are at least compassionate for you having those feelings and they understand why. So that's a pure state. Agreed? Agreed? 
And then there's the impure state. And the impure state is doing it so that you get a whole heap of things from somebody else. Now, a celestial spirit doesn't do that with you. He, do he doesn't give you all this compassion that he has in order to get from you a whole heap of approval and acceptance and avoid your fe his fear of you and all those other things. He doesn't do any of that. So that side of what you call your personality is a side that has two facets. One facet is a facet that's in harmony with love in the end, and there's the facet that's out of harmony with love and only in harmony with your own addictive desires. Let's look at the desire-based part of your life. The music, the art, the design-based uh, part of your life, the, what you call the expression of yourself. Right? That part, there are two parts. Some of the time you do it in order to get approval and acceptance and, and other and things like that. And have this sort of um, fulfilment of the rebellion feeling that you have with your family. Carry, you embody it, you know, you live in it yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then some of it's a pure desire. You know, driven by pure personality and so forth. So uh, what we have as a tendency and what I'm trying to illustrate to you is that initially when you ask your question, there's this sort of feeling in you of what, both parts of these things are good, but how do I balance them? And I'm saying to you, no, they're both not good yet. There's good bits in them, but they're both not pure yet because if they were pure, they would already be in balance. There would be no disharmony between the two things. They'd seamlessly happen in your life. Yes. So, so when we notice this kind of thing happening where we're trading off one part of our nature or personality for another part of our nature or personality, we've got to understand that in both parts, in both sides, there's going to be addictions that we have to face. And so what I would do is I'd go, I'd get out a notebook. And this is what I do, as Mary knows. I've got whole I've libraries got, of notebooks. Yes, today. me too. <laughs> um, and I would write down all of the addictions I get met by being empathetic to others. And I'd write down all of the things that are in harmony with God about having some empathy for others. And then, conversely, I would do the same with the other part of my life, the artistic side of my life. I'd write down all the things that are addictive about it and all the things that I are actually feel are in harmony with God about it. And then what I would do is I'd get all the ones that are our addictions, lump them all together, see which ones are common, because you will find commonalities, and then work through them one by one, starting with the most important. <laughs> That's what I would do. And so I would start, let's say, the most important one was an addiction that was affecting my relationship with Mary. To me, anything that affects my relationship with God, first, my relationship with Mary or, and myself next, they are the first things I'm going to focus on. So... So if I notice a addiction that's affecting my relationship with God, that's what I start with. I work on that. I work on what my fear is underneath it. I try to become aware of it intellectually. And then I allow myself to start connecting emotionally with whatever those particular things are. So that's what I would suggest to yourself as a process to go through. And it might take you some months or even years to resolve some of them. That's great. Thanks. And if you're wondering about which is the most important one to start with, I just go with the one that feels the most scary to challenge. Because that's, that's, that's the jackpot one that's affecting the most of your relationship with God and yourself and your partner. Yeah. It's, it's the one you're so invested in staying away from. And that, that's the rapid way to grow. We can do it the other way around, but it always takes a lot longer. Yeah. What I notice is this for most people. Here's a scale of what is a f of emotion. Like, so these are different emotions. And these are the ones that we have the least amount of fear about. So this is a scale of fear in this direction. And let's say, so that emotion there, we are least afraid of. Huh? And you know what most people do first? They do that one. So they feel that emotion. And then this one here that we've got more fear of, down the track sometime. So this is time. In time, in that access, right, time. Down the track sometime they get to feel strong enough, as they say, to do with that emotion. Does that make sense? And then sometime down the track they realise there's this thing they're bigger fear about and then they deal with that emotion. Now, if you can actively choose to deal with the emotion that you currently identify as your largest fear right now, 
Can you see what the benefit of that would be? It would change lots of aspects of your life straight away. So if you could, and by the way, it's not possible to deal with your very most largest fear right now. And the reason why it's not possible is because not, not, there are fears that you have in you right now that you don't even identify, that are even larger than the ones you've identified. But if you can find the fear that is the largest one you've identified, and instead of dealing with it two years' time, or ten years' time, or wait till the law of attraction brings you a whole series of events that get too painful and then you deal with it, bring that forward and deal with it now. Right now. What will happen is your life will significantly change very rapidly if you do that. Does that make sense? If you choose, like most people do, to deal with the small one first and the next one first, and by the way, most people do, who do that get to a point where one fear is what they call too big, and do you know where the rest of the life is? Butting their head against that one fear for the rest of their life. Right? But if you can identify what the fear is that you find, the largest fear that you have right at this point in time, and choose to go through the experience of it emotionally, then what will happen is you, you will rapidly speed up your own progression. Right, that's how to rapidly speed up your own progression. Focus on what is your greatest fear that you know of. Because, by the way, you must remember that there are fears you don't know of that are even greater. Right? But at least if you choose to deal with the ones you know of and focus on dealing with that and actually go through it, you will speed up your progression so rapidly that uh, that your whole life will change very rapidly as a result. Yeah. Yeah. It is exciting because what it does is it gives you control <laughs> and not that you're seeking control, but it gives you control of how fast you can progress. Right? The persons who progress the most slowly are the persons who decide to deal with their smallest fears first. Which makes sense, doesn't it? And it's only when they feel ready, as they say, to deal with the next fear that they do go ahead and deal with it. And for this reason, um, like for a lot of women, there's a lot of sexual fears that they might have. So that's right up here. <laughs> and so for, for many relationships, this is why many men get frustrated in their relationships with women, is they often feel frustrated in their relationship with women sexually because the woman has no intention of dealing with that fear at all. She knows it's there, but she has no intention of dealing with it, right? Until some course of events cause her to be forced to dealing with it. And even then, I've seen many women pass in the spirit world, even after the events have all occurred, and still not dealing with it. So you're far better off if you know you have a fear, bring that fear forward to now, feel through it, work on it, put some effort into doing the work on it mm -hmm. and let yourself feel it because that will cause so much healing of your life but will also create so much joy once those biggest fears go desires of all kinds start coming out of you that you never knew you had before so this is a beautiful thing about any any fear you know you have bring it forward to now address it now feel it now work your way through it now don't put it off don't wait until events catch up with you. Do it now. If a person does that, you will progress very rapidly and also experience joy in your progression. Because you imagine, if that fear is out of you, this huge one's out of you, so that if we compare the fears, here's the little fear here. There's the bar chart, if you like. We'll do a bar <laughs> chart. Here's the little fear. Here's the big fear. Which one's going to make you feel better if it's gone? <laughs> isn't it quite obvious <laughs> this one is going to make you feel better if it's gone isn't it not this one this one will hardly have any effect on your life at all this one once it's gone it's going to wow I'm going to feel like a completely different person after that one's gone so it would make sense wouldn't it logically to address which fear the one that's going to have the biggest potential positive effect on your life if it was gone most of us deal with life exactly the opposite way. 
We do everything we possibly can to avoid that fear, to make it disappear using our intellect, to make out it's not even there in the first place. We manufacture our life manufacture in a big way our around life it. to avoid it. We create our comfort-based life to support that fear remaining in us, right? And then we wonder why we're not happy. And then we wonder why we don't know what we desire. Then we wonder why, you know, why we don't live a life that's always changing and growing. And the reason why is because we're not addressing the fear that dominates our life. If you can address the fears that dominate your life first, then these little fears, they'll feel like little nothings. And what I see a lot of people doing is they get to this little fear and they go, wow, I dealt with this huge thing the other day. And I go, huge thing, what, what change has it had on your life? And they even have a struggle to think about how it's changed their life. <laughs> and, and I'm going, that's not a huge thing, that's a tiny little thing and your only reason why you dealt with that is because you lack the courage to deal with that. Right, isn't it, in the end? It's just an, a, 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 an attitude change in terms of what courage you have. Now, the people who deal with those big fears that they identify progress more rapidly, they become happier faster, they enjoy more of God's love as a result if they long for God's love, their life changes more rapidly. With, you can meet them one year and meet them the next year and it's like their whole life is different because they've addressed these particular problems in their life. Now, I've met people like that. There's, there's a few people that we've met like that who deal with those. And it's, it's such a joy also to be with them because every conversation is not constructed around preventing that fear. <laughs> the average person I meet, every conversation we have, every question that I answer is all about trying to prevent the fear, not, not find it. Right? And this is what we must understand about the psychology of our own fear. The psychology of our own fear is such that our fear, we've come to learn, most of us have come to learn, that our fear, these big fears, are the ones that you spend your whole life trying to prevent the feeling of. Right? And so I suggest that if your life isn't changing rapidly and, you've and things in your life aren't improving rapidly, your relationship's not improving rapidly, it's because you want to do the gradual little things. You want to do the little fear that you can manage every time. That's why it's not changing rapidly. Once you, once you do these things, process through that, you can see logically it's going to have a huge impact on your life in so many different areas. And what I like about dealing with these big ones too is that it affects, they all affect your life in almost every area. So as soon as it's removed, your life in almost every area changes positively. Right? But the problem with these little fears is they usually only affect your life in one area. And so if you remove them, it's only that one area that changes. It still needs to be removed, of course but it's only that one area that changes. And also, once you have faced and felt this fear, how easy do you think it's going to be to deal with this one? And it's like a molehill, right, in comparison. And so that's what it feels like in comparison. You, you go through it quite easily in comparison to these very large ones. So if you know you have certain fears, what I would be doing with my fears and what I've done with mine is I list them in order of how big they are inside of myself. And I focused on the biggest ones first. Because I find that if I don't, my life will change very slowly. And I don't know about you, but I like my life changing rapidly, not slowly. Is that all right? So understand that obviously whenever we have um, opposing feelings occurring within us, it's because we have certain fears and therefore certain addictions in play. And don't be surprised if some of the things you think are good about yourself actually have a lot of addictions in them. And don't be surprised that some of the things you think are bad about yourself actually also have a lot of purity in them. Right? Don't be surprised of those things. Because in the end, that's the kind of things that God will show you through the process.